So let's get started then with the modern portfolio theory and what it's all about and generally speaking uh, what to expect in your RO2 in relation to modern portfolio theory. So what I think it's important to understand is that this is a theory uh, developed in the late 1950s, early 1960s. There was lots of uh, investment theorists involved in its uh, uh, creation, albeit Harry Markovich is the one that largely gets the credit for it. And the whole idea of MPT really is that investors want to maximise their investment returns whilst minimising their risk. And that's kind of the core of which all modern portfolio theory rests, really. And we will measure the risk largely through modern portfolio by a standard deviation, which is an area we're going to look at next. Um, how widely uh, the returns deviate away from their average mean returns. And ultimately, what we're going to learn is that a diversification is key in reducing risks whilst maximising the potential returns from the investments and not putting all your eggs in one basket, uh, whatever that means, is going to be crucial in your uh, understanding of how we reduce risk. So uh, we can measure diversification as well, that's within here, and uh, the, the measure of the effectiveness of diversification is the correlation that exists between two assets and we're going to be looking very closely at uh, um, a number of things here standard deviation correlation being two of the, the the main protagonists so let's start by looking at standard deviation which as we've already alluded to is a measure of risk which is used within modern portfolio theory and uh, it's the most widely used uh, measure of risk um, in investment theories uh, and it's really a measure of volatility how volatile an investment is and uh, how widely the investment uh, varies from its average mean returns with a large variation away from the average return demonstrating high volatility and uh, an investment that perhaps stays quite close to its average mean returns demonstrating lower volatility and I think it's important to understand that the higher the standard deviation the higher the number you see of standard deviation, the higher uh, the risk is, the higher the volatility is. Um, but I think it's important to temper uh, this particular measure by the fact that, of course, um, standard deviation itself is, is calculated based on historic data, uh, which may or may not be replicated in the future. And uh, this will not be the first nor the last time you would hear uh, that phrase within the RO2 exam that to a, one step further then and look at the uh, standardized percentage returns that you'd expect within one two and three standard deviations and you would not necessarily need to learn these numbers in the exam but certainly you'd need to recognize that one standard deviation is the the low of the figure 68 two standard deviations is 95 and three is 99 percent of the time it's unlikely you'll see three standard deviations, to be fair, in your RO2. But what do these figures mean? Well, I think it's important that we understand from the start that one standard deviation is the variation of returns expected positively and negatively away from the mean average returns. We see our little stick man there with the bell curve at the bottom, and uh, that is a mirrored image, and standard deviation is mirrored. So if you have one standard deviation, it's, it's, it's the variation away from the average, both positive and negative, which will be equal. And one standard deviation covers 68% of occurrences on average. So two out of three years, you roughly, you'd expect the returns of an investment with a mean of X to vary between two different figures, positively and negatively. And we'll be looking at an example of this shortly. Adding a second standard deviation on, which will be exactly the same uh, amount either side again, um, widens that to 95% of the time, which obviously makes it uh, more likely to ring true than 68% of the time. And finally, three standard deviations is nearly all of the time. And uh, the bigger and wider you throw your net, the more likely you are to capture the expected returns uh, from these particular investments. We're going to look at an example of this next, and hopefully that will, uh, uh, will, will finalise your understanding of exactly what we mean by these deviations.
OK, so let's have a look at an example of standard deviation in action then, shall we? And uh, we've got an investment that has a mean averaged return of 15% based on past performance, of course, with a standard deviation of 7. And it's asking us what range of returns can be expected within a single standard deviation, within two standard deviations, and finally within three standard deviations. So on the next slide, we're going to look at the answers and uh, all will be revealed. So working through them sequentially then, we have the one standard deviation first and this is 68% of course of chance of these returns based on its own past performance really. And uh, what we've done is we've literally added and deducted 7 from 15 uh, once either way. So uh, from 15 we have 15 minus 7 to give us 8 and uh, we've got 15 plus 7 we have 22. So what this is basically telling us, within one standard deviation, you would expect that that would cover 68% of occurrences, that the range of returns for this investment with a mean return of 15 and a standard deviation of 7, the variance would be between 8 and 22. So two out of three years, roughly, with an average of 15, the range of returns will be a positive 8 to positive 22. Broadening that out to two standard deviations, what we're simply going to do is we're going to take away the 7 again and we're going to add the 7 again. So essentially what we have here is we have 15 as the average again of course, uh, two 7s we've drawn which is uh, 14, taking off 15 leaves us with 1 and uh, 14 added, two 7s added, uh, takes 15 to 29. So in 95% of occurrences you would expect that this particular investment with an average of 15 would have a variance between a positive 1 and a positive 29% return per annum. Finally, the three standard deviations figure, which is unlikely to feature in uh, RO2, as we've already said, covers virtually every potential uh, incident, so barring a complete and utter um, out-of-the-blue uh, episode then we would expect that this investment would be between minus 6 and 36. So what we've done there, quite simply, is we've taken 7 off 3 times and we've added uh, 7 on 3 times to the mean return of 15 to give us that variance. And uh, the wider the, uh, the variance, it's more likely to be covered, obviously, by uh, a bigger number of deviations. We're now going to turn our attention to what is effectively a measure of the effectiveness of diversification and that is correlation which is an important part of the exam almost inevitable that you're going to get a question on this and I guess the way to think about correlation is the chemical reaction that occurs between two assets is measured by its correlation on a scale from minus one through zero up to plus one and uh, that is the, the range of returns that you can expect. Generally speaking, minus 1 is essentially 100% difference. Minus 0.9, 90% difference, right the way through to plus 0.9 being 90% the same. So that is a kind of the scale that you need to consider this to be. Positive correlation is anything that is essentially... Uh, a positive number. So that runs from uh, positive 0.1 up to 1. And what this tells us if two assets are positively correlated is that they will move up and down in the same direction um, by the different amounts dependent on how correlated they are. So this is something that investors would look to combine in a portfolio if they want to concentrate their capital in a particular area, reduce their diversification, uh, to try and uh, make um, um, a high degree of gains. So positive correlation, whilst it may be effective for diversification in part, is not the most effective um, way that you can combine assets to uh, meet your diversification needs. We've then got negative correlation, which, uh, as the name would suggest, runs from minus 0.1 to minus 1. And I think it's important to understand that this means that if one asset goes up, the other asset goes down, 
uh, or vice versa. And the degree to which they move in opposite directions to each other will be determined by the number. The greater the negative number, the more of it is that these assets will actually uh, uh, vary in their um, up and down returns. And then we've got no correlation, which is essentially zero, where you cannot actually encounter any uh, link between the two returns. And we're going to expand on this over the course of the, uh, the next couple of slides. The most common type of question you're going to get in correlation is a correlation table as shown on uh, this particular screen here. And uh, it will often ask you which two assets you would combine uh, to create the best positive correlation, uh, the best diversification, or alternatively to create non-correlation. So we're gonna look at uh, examples of that and show how that's worked on the next particular slide. But I think it's, it's good to give you an overview of this up front really. If you're asked which two assets to combine to create the highest positive correlation, then you are going to look for the highest positive number that appears on this particular chart. You will then go across horizontally from that number and up vertically from that number, which will help you show which two assets you would combine. You are not looking for two numbers. The actual table has done the work for you. Secondly, you might be asked which two assets you would combine for the greatest diversification. In these circumstances, and knowing that actually diversification is best achieved from negatively correlated assets, you will choose the biggest negative number. Again, highlighting the number in, in, on the actual uh, uh, table, going up and across to see which two assets it is that provide that particular level of diversification. If you ask to cut which two assets to combine for non-correlation, then you will pick the number that's either at zero or the closest to zero. And choosing the closest, whether positive or negative to zero, following the same mantra of going up and down across the table to work out which two assets it is that provide that non-correlation will be your technique. So let's put that technique into practice then, shall we? And um, it asks uh, at the bottom here which we, we would combine or which two assets we would combine for positive correlation, the greatest positive correlation, for the best diversification and for non-correlation. So we're literally going to look at the table uh, for each of these and work it from there. So for positive correlation, you look at the table and you look for the highest positive number that you would have seen. It would actually appear twice because the table is, is, is synchronized that way. And you would hopefully be able to spot um, either of the 0.7s as being the highest positive number. You move from that number across horizontally to see asset A and up vertically to see asset B. 0 0.7 have, uh, uh, is the correlation between A and B, which is the highest on the table the greatest positive correlation. For diversification, you follow the same technique, but you're looking for the biggest negative number or the highest negative number. That would be minus 0.4. Again, moving horizontally and vertically away from minus 0.4, whichever one of the minus 0.4s you work from would show you assets B and C have the biggest negative correlation at no, minus 0 0.4 so you combine b and c for diversification for non-correlation remember the tactic we pick the closest to zero the closest number to zero here recognizing the grid runs from minus one through zero to plus one is 0 0.1 which again following our little technique of moving across horizontally and up vertically from the assets you should see that at 0.1, the closest number to zero is asset C and D that you would combine to create non-correlation. So I think it's important as a overriding technique for the whole of the exam to understand the relationship that correlation, diversification and hedging does. Because you are regularly asked in this exam uh, the steps you should take to reduce risk essentially.
And uh, the answer to that question is you should either diversify or alternatively, you should try to reduce your risk through hedging. Ourselves as investors tend to diversify and fund managers tend to use hedging as their method of um, such risk reduction. You can measure the diversification's effectiveness through correlation. So you're likely to see multiple questions around this subject matter. Just to reiterate, we diversify best by recombining negatively correlated assets. The problem is, is that can reduce the gains. And as always, is diversification the right steps to take? Well, that all depends on what your actual the outlook is and what the future economic and, uh, and market conditions uh, uh, dictate. The next step we're going to look at within modern portfolio uh, theory is that of the efficient frontier, um, which is actually a chart which aims to uh, show the optimum trade-off of risk and return uh, for equities in a certain particular market. So the efficient frontiers is a visual representation that we'll see on the next slide, looking to show you essentially the optimum returns of an in investments for any given level of risk. And it's often used in the selection of investments um, in trying to compare and contrast between different product providers perhaps as to which provides the, the best trade-off. So if you are a rational investor, then following modern portfolio theory, you would want the investment that provides you with the greatest uh, degree of return for the lowest degree of risk. And uh, that will be shown on the efficient frontier curve on the line. A rational investor would choose essentially investments that offer this uh, best trade-off of risk and return. So ultimately, the efficient frontier um, is a con constantly moving feast based on past performance but aims to give you an idea of what has been the best trade-off in the past. Here's an example of an efficient frontier chart. So you'll see on the vertical axes, we have the returns of an investment, uh, which is normally the past performance. And then on the horizontal axes, we've got the risks of investments uh, as measured by standard deviation. So on the horizontal chart, the more to the left, as you look at this particular chart, um, you see an asset, the lower the standard deviation, the lower the risk of the investment that's been shown. So if you look at asset A, which actually sits on the efficient frontier line, that is horizontally level with B, they essentially have achieved the uh, same degree of return However, A, being further to the left, has achieved those returns with a lower uh, level of risk. So when considering this trade-off of risk and return, one would suggest that you would be better off selecting A as opposed to B. Why? Because they have the same returns, but A is less risky than B. Again, you can compare B and C in the same way. These are vertically in line with one another, which essentially means that their risks as we go across the standard deviation chart are identical. But with C being above B on the vertical axes, C achieved a greater return than B, even though they share the same degree of risk. So a rational investor would choose C over B. A rational investor would choose A over B. Both A and C sit on the efficient frontier line, which effectively means they represent the portfolio with the greatest trade-off of risk and return based on the past performance over the period measured. Again, that's replicated with C and D and D and E. C and D are essentially horizontally on the same level, which means that their returns are the same. However, C is further to the left than D, representing the lower risk. And last of all, D and D, they are in line vertically, which means that their risks are the same, but E has achieved a greater return than D. Now, one could ask themselves, should you choose A, should you choose C, or should you choose E? 
And the answer is that, generally speaking, that would depend on the investor's appetite for risk. A lower risk investor would choose A, medium risk perhaps C, and a higher risk choosing E. Albeit, generally speaking, the efficient frontier shows investments within the same sector. So we're talking of degrees of risk here on a common ground. So the efficient frontier can be a very useful tool for fund managers in particular to use in relation to combining uh, investments within a portfolio, but it's not without its criticisms nor without its limitations. And it can be seen to be quite idealistic and based on past performance, it's not always uh, that reliable. So you occasionally will get questions in RO2 around the limitations of the efficient frontier and uh, in, in, in its over-reliance. So some of the limitations are, first of all, it assumes that standard deviation is a sound risk indicator. Now, whilst it's largely undisputed that standard deviation is uh, theoretically sound, it's very, very difficult to measure an investor's risk profile using standard deviation. And as such, that can uh, throw into question the effectiveness of the, uh, the frontier. Also, it assumes normally distributed returns and is based on historic data, as of course all past performance figures are. And uh, neither of those may prove to be reliable going forward, particularly the latter of those, the historic data, because um, the performance in the future of an investment will not only uh, dictate its uh, performance, it will also change effectively the standard deviation of the investment. And also transaction costs are excluded from the uh, particular uh, uh, scenario. So if there are any advice fees as an example, then obviously they could distort which actual investment produces the best returns uh, thereafter. And the costs are excluded from the measure on, on that going forward. So uh, to be taken with a pinch of salt, I think is a, a good analogy to use. So having explored standard deviation and its use through the efficient frontier, we're now going to turn our attention to an alternative measure of risk, which is that of beta, a measure of the market risk as a whole. Now we'll explore systematic risk in a lot more detail in chapter number five. So we're not going to uh, double up and spend a lot of time considering that here. But uh, for now, we're going to accept that the market uh, as a whole um, is measured by beta, systematic risk, market risk, measured by beta. And uh, we're going to explore what beta is. So beta is essentially this measure, and uh, the market is said to have a beta of 1, a numerical value of 1. So I suppose what is a market? Well, let's say it's a stock market index for the time being. There's a classic example of this. The stock market index, the FTSE 100 for etc., might be the market by which your investments are compared. And that would have a beta of 1. So if your investment has a beta of more than 1, greater than 1, then you are essentially more risky than the market by which you're being compared. Likewise, if you have a beta of, uh, let's say, 0 0.8, which of course is below 1, in that circumstance, in that situation, you are um, faced with an investment that is less risky than the market as a whole. And that should turn into equivalent returns. So if you invest in an investment that has a beta above 1, then you should be rewarded in equal measures uh, with an equivalent uh, uh, return uh, to reward you for the risks that you've taken. Likewise, if you invest in any fund that's got a beta below one, you should be prepared to compromise the returns being lower than the market by which you compared for playing it safe. So uh, that's pretty much how beta works. So important for us to understand that every single individual investment has its own beta. They're all compared with a relevant market and that market has a beta of one. So beta is widely used to measure the volatility of an investment compared to the market average. It is essentially an external risk measure comparing your own investment against that of the market.
and as we've already said the figures below uh, one would re refer to an investment that's low uh, lower risk than the market and uh, any number above uh, one uh, as a beta would indicate that the actual investment is greater uh, risk than the market now these numbers actually do mean something and I think it's important for us to recognise that in equal measures, risk and return should be equal. It never generally is, but it should be. And uh, that would mean that if you have a beta of 0 0.8 in your investment, then that is 0 0.2 lower than the beta of 1. In essence, that is a percentage return. That's 0 0.2. That is essentially 20%. So if you have an investment that has a beta of 1, and uh, you have an investment that has a beta of 0 0.8, the 0 0.2 lower of the second asset is essentially 20% lower risk as measured by uh, market risk beta. Likewise, if you've got an investment that's higher than 1, 1 1.2, that's 0 0.2 higher, that essentially is 20% higher risk than the market by which you're being compared. Ultimately, the higher the beta, the higher the risk when comparing assets uh, against one another or against the market as a whole. So there we have it really. We've discussed uh, standard deviation and beta over the course of this little uh, mini module. And uh, both are risk measures, but they're used in different ways and they're actually a measure in different things, albeit they both measure risk. So standard deviation, the first one we looked at, synonymous with uh, the modern portfolio theory, is essentially a measure of internal volatility. So you're not comparing an asset with a third party asset, another asset. You are simply looking at how widely the investment deviates away from its average mean returns, an internal risk volatility model, therefore. Beta, on the other hand, is not about internal returns and uh, the vo volatility. It is more to do with the investment's comparison with the market by which it's being compared. So beta is an external volatility measure measured against the market risks. The greater the, the, the risk measure on both partners, though, the greater the actual risks that they are. In other words, the bigger the number of standard deviation, the bigger the number of beta, the more it would indicate greater risk. And we're going to explore uh, later in this module how beta is sometimes used in a way to try and predict um, what returns you may get from an investment, the theoretical expected return uh, that you would see. The final slide that we're going to use to close off this mini section here is to do with um, non-systematic risk. Now, again, we will explore this in much more detail in chapter number five, uh, learn, sorry, learning outcome number five, which is coming your way later. Uh, but uh, I think it's important to also understand the difference between systematic and non-systematic risk. So we've already established that systematic risk is, is market risk, the risks of the market as a whole, while well, non-systematic risk is the risks associated with a particular investment or asset or company or whatever the case may be, really. And uh, this can be removed by careful diversification, by effective diversification, by combining negatively correlated assets, essentially allows you to remove non-systematic risk, which you simply uh, cannot say you can do with systematic risk, which is unremovable. This is the whole eggs and baskets analogy, really, that if you want to reduce your non-systematic risk, you spread your money around. But diversification comes in many shapes and sizes. It's not just all about asset allocation. There's geographical, there's active versus passive managed, company sizes, big and small. All of that adds to the diversification conundrum. So ultimately, Every investment has a combination of systematic and non-systematic risk. You can't remove systematic, you can remove non-systematic, or at least take steps to reduce it. And how do you do that? Through diversification.